Okay, it's a, it's a pleasure to have Shea here with us today, and she'll tell us uh, about sequential generation of Cheshire string and other defects. Please take it away. Thanks, Aproof, and uh, the organizers. And it's really nice to be here and uh, to tell you my very um, um, naive understanding of all these um, non-invertible category symmetry and defects. So I come from a more uh, condensed matter and, and quantum information background. So, so, so I have lots of questions when I was learning about all these fancy symmetries and defect. And this is this talk is it represents some of our effort trying to address up some of the the questions we have. Uh, so sorry about my voice. I'm a little congested these days, but uh, hopefully it's it's still fine. Uh, and uh, any questions is welcome. Uh, so please interrupt me anytime if you if you have questions. Okay. Yeah. So as you see on the on the slide, there's uh, this um, mysterious cat. This is the famous Cheshire cat. Uh, that's there and not there. Um, it's, it's it seems to be there, but it's also not there. And uh, so this, of course, is um where the the name Cheshire string or Cheshire charge comes from. People borrow that name uh, from Alice in Wonderland to describe basically a pretty uh, simple phenomena of charge condensation uh, in gauge theories. And um and the the, the talk I'll I'll be giving today is about uh, how to think about uh, generating such kind of defects uh, using quantum circuits uh, and, and, and other, other defects. Okay, so this is based on two of the papers uh, that we already posted. Uh, one is, a, a, the first is a longer one. It's about a sequential quantum circuit. I'll, say something about what that is about. Um, but this first paper is about mapping between different gap phases uh, using the so-called sequential quantum circuit. And then the second paper is about using the same type of circuit um, but for generating defects, including uh, the so-called Cheshire string uh, inside a topological book. Okay. All right, so let me uh, back off and uh, talk a little bit about um, what, it is, what it is that got me so confused and got me so uncomfortable about hearing all these discussions about um, um, these defects and, uh, and generalized symmetries. So, so, so uh, the, 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 the thing that we feel we pretty well understood are so-called two plus one D topological order that we have some two plus one D system and potentially they can uh, have some uh, non-trivial topological order. And uh, the crucial features of such topological system include that um, there are there are any ions that point fractional excitations that move around. So if we want to characterize uh, the topological order, we need to first say what are the anion types? What, what types of anions do we have in the system? Usually we have a finite set. And then uh, the anions can fuse with each other um, uh, into a third one or into a sum of a bunch of things. And then there's exchange and, and braiding statistics uh, between uh, the anions that can be used for quantum computation. Uh, this is uh, the braiding. And of course, all this, all this is very nicely captured uh, in the mathematical framework called um, braided fusion category. I'm not pretending that I uh, understand every word. I'm just putting the big word out and saying that mathematicians seem to have a, a very good handle uh, on, on, the, on the structure, on, on this um, uh, characterization of 2 plus 1D topological order. And uh, let me just give a, a very simple example, everybody's favorite example, sorry. The 2 plus 1D target code. Um, the 2 plus 1D target code, of course, have. Um, uh, so as I want to talk a little bit, of course, I assume many people already know this, but I want to establish a little um, notation because I'm going to get deeper uh, into this particular example later. So 
So the Tari code, two plus one D Tari code, of course, we all know that it has um, three non-trivial types of anions, the E, the M, and their composite, which is a fermion. And their fusion rule is like this. And there's some, uh, the, the E and the M are both on the, uh, the F is a fermion. And there's a mutual uh, pi statistics between uh, any two uh, non-equivalent type of anions. And um, of course, the if we want to talk about the, the full content uh, of the data that we need to describe the, the Brady fusion category, we also need this associator, which is uh, usually called the F move uh, that maps between different um, order of fusing uh, three anions into, into a fourth one. So for Tarko, this is trivial. This is just one. And then going to uh, a three plus one D topological order, um, um, I always thought that we understand everything. I always thought that, oh, this is simple, at least for the simple cases uh, that we understand what's going on. For in particular, let's say for just the three plus one D Tari code, right? What else can be there? We know that this is um, the three plus one DZ two gauge theory. And as a, as a discrete gauge theory, uh, there's a point excitation uh, in the form of a point charge. So this is this is the point here. The point is a point gauge charge excitation. And then we have a, a flux loop excitation um, in, the, in the form of a one-dimensional loop. Uh, it carries the, the gauge flux of the gauge theory. And then we know that um, what happens, non-trivial thing that can happen between them. Uh, so sorry, the non-trivial thing that can happen is, first of all, the, the charge can be either uh, boson or fermion. That's two possibilities. Uh, and then um, the charge can braid around the flux um, and giving rise to a, a minus one phase factor, the Horonov bomb phase factor, basically. Um, so it's as simple as that. And uh, it seems that everything's pretty uh, straightforward. And of course, later on, we also know that um, this is not the end of the story. If we have um, bigger symmetry groups, we can actually have um, uh, more, more variety of statistics. Uh, in particular, we can have so-called loop-loop rating. And here we need three loops. Uh, we need a, a base flux loop. This is, this is the, the gamma. And then we need a, an alpha loop and a beta loop. And alpha and beta are and they're linked uh, on gamma. And, and when they're linked on gamma, uh, they can give rise to different statistics uh, than when they're not linked with gamma. And this is the so-called three-loop rating statistics and studied by a bunch of papers. Uh, maybe I'm not even citing everybody. Um, and, then, uh, and then when we braid alpha around beta, uh, this in, in some cases can give rise to non-trivial statistics. So this is beyond just uh, charge and flux. Okay, and uh, and then um, well, the, then the question is, what is the general uh, mathematical framework for describing this? And I hear a lot about <laughs> higher category theory. I can't pretend that I understand. I maybe understand not, not much. I, I can't say I understand at all. I'm trying to very hard to understand what is going on, but I hear a lot of big words. I see a lot of big notations. So I'm trying to do my own very naive thing uh, in order to make sense of what is this so-called um, higher category theory. So, so my approach is um, more from explicit models, uh, lattice models, and, and making things concrete, and then I can see what's going on. Okay. Okay. So, Excuse me. So sorry, there's some virus going around. Um, so so this um so one particular thing that I'm trying to understand and it gets discussed uh, in all these papers that also talk about uh, the more general higher category structure is uh, the so-called Cheshire string. So I thought, okay, let's let's get a crack on that and see if we can understand what's going on with the Cheshire string. Um, so Cheshire string um, basically um, is, is something composed of a symmetry charge. So 
so we know that um, if we apply uh, the, the gauge charges, they can be created uh, from the vacuum in pairs. So we can apply a string operator and create a, a pair of gauge charge like that uh, at the two end. And then once they're created, we can move them around. We can extend the string operator and, and move the, the gauge charges further away from each other. So the idea of treasure string is to say, okay, what if I enforce uh, this, this little segment of string operator as my Hamiltonian? So I want my um, system to be in the ground state of this modified uh, Hamiltonian where I create uh, charge and hop them around with this little segment uh, of uh, charge operator. And uh, so if we just have one term, if we just have a little segment, and then the, the ground state will be a superposition of having nothing and then having a pair of charges. So because um, the string operator topples between the two. So this, it will be the superposition of no charge and uh, a pair of charge, a pair of charges. Uh, but then if we uh, decide to um, take a lot of these terms, for example, uh, along this one dimensional uh, cylinder shape defect, if we decide to do that along the whole length uh, of the defect, just take any, all of the little segment of string operators out of the, uh, the the region, and then uh, take the Hamiltonian to be the sum of all these terms. Uh, then we'll be able to freely create and move charges uh, along the whole defect. And because of that, the ground state will be a superposition of many different configurations. Uh, one is uh, there's no charge at all, and the other is two charge, but like here, and then uh, there and then two charge separated far, further away, or four charge or six charge, and basically any even number of uh, configuration of gauge charges. So any such configuration will take them and make a superposition of them, and that becomes the ground state uh, of this Hamiltonian of um, the sum of the, the little string segments. And, this, and, and, and when we modify the Hamiltonian inside a gauge theory like this, uh, we get the so-called uh, Cheshire string. And what's special about this defect is that when we do that, it basically forms a condensate uh, of the gauge charge because the, the it has it's a superposition of um, all possible configurations of gauge charges. So it becomes a condensate of gauge charge. And when we have a condensate of gauge charge, then if we bring another gauge charge into the condensate, it disappears. Uh, we don't see that. Uh, we, at least we don't see that from a local uh, reduced density matrix. So any any local measurement will be able to tell that uh, we have brought another another charge into the defect. So this is why people uh, make the analogy to the um, to the Cheshire cat, which seems to be there but also not there. So it's more mysterious. But actually, if we think of it as a charge condensate, it's not that mysterious at all. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so this Cheshire string is basically where uh, anions or gauge charges are condensed. Uh, and, uh, and when the gauge charge is condensed... Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Can I ask I a quick clarification question? If you go to the previous, yeah, this slide, we write the Hamiltonian equals to this uh, sum. But is that the total Hamiltonian, or do you mean that you add to the three plus one d z two gauge theory Hamiltonian by this term? I'm a little bit lost. Yes. Sorry, of course. Yes, we have a, a background uh, of three plus one d gauge theory. So okay. I realize okay. it's very really confusing. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thanks. So, so we we start from a let's say Tari code uh, Hamiltonian. And then change the Hamiltonian along the defect uh, to be this. I see. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Otherwise, we don't we don't have much going on in the background. Right. 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 Which would be another interesting question, but <laughs> not this time. <laughs> um. Okay. Okay. So this is uh. So so yeah. So 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 
the, the box, the whole box is filled with um, three plus one DC two gauge theory. It's not vacuum. It's not a trivial state. Right. So um, yeah. So so this defect is where uh, the anions and gauge charges are condensed. And when the gauge charge is condensed, uh, we say that the gauge symmetry uh, is higgsed. Uh, so basically, there's some symmetry breaking going on. We can think of the gate charge as going to a symmetry breaking state. Uh, and then uh, adding a charge does not create uh, any local excitations. So, so it becomes something that cannot see. Uh, and, all, and of course, adding charge does, adding one charge to the condensate does take it to a different state because originally we had a, a, a superposition of even particle configurations. And if we add one charge, we'll have a superposition of odd number of particle configurations, superpositions. Um, but ju this just means that these two are degenerate and they correspond to the uh, symmetry breaking degeneracy uh, that we can have in, a, in, a, in an ungauge system. All right, so, um, so this, this Cheshire string, uh, uh, it actually had a pretty long history. The name was cooked up uh, in the 1990s uh, when people were thinking about non-abelian gauge theory. Uh, and, uh, and in non-abelian gauge theory, this Cheshire string shows up in a, in a more natural way, I would say. Uh, because basically, uh, when we have a non-abelian gauge theory, uh, the flux loop the flux loop of a non-abelian gauge theory has to break at least part of the gauge symmetry because unless it's in the center, but the generic flux loop, uh, it doesn't commute with everything. It's non-abelian. Uh, so it breaks part of the gauge symmetry. And, uh, and because of that, um, each such flux loops, uh, they're naturally Cheshire in a sense that uh, um, some of the gauge charges uh, will condense on the loop, in particular the gauge charge that that, tra that transform non-trivially under the part of the, the symmetry that gets broken, and that will condense on the loop. And for example, if we have the simplest S3 group, um, smallest non-abelian group, and if we take the rotation and try to make a flux loop out, out of that, of course we know that uh, the flux loop is labeled by uh, the conjugacy class, which contains two elements, and that actually exactly corresponds to this degeneracy uh, induced by uh, the charge condensate. So this is all part of the same story for, for non-abelian gauge theory, uh, theory, that flux loop are automatically uh, Cheshire. Uh, there's another context where uh, Cheshire string shows up on flux loop um, in a natural way, and this is abelian gauge theory but abelian gauge theory with some of the non-trivial uh, loop braiding statistics. And this is emphasized uh, in this paper by Dominic Els and Chetan Nayak. And they pointed out that uh, when we have uh, this, if we have, let's say, a, a Z2 cross Z2 abelian gauge theory, uh, which has non-trivial three loop braiding, what happens is that uh, uh, this base loop, this gamma loop, if we um, think of the base loop stretched out in the x, y plane, and then imagine that we compress the whole system from 3D back to 2D doing a dimension reduction, just compress the system in the, in the z direction so that it reduces from a three-dimensional system to a two-dimensional system with the gamma base loop uh, in, in the x, y plane. Uh, and then the base loop basically becomes a boundary of different 2D topological orders. So I won't go into detail why this is the case, but with three loop braiding, we can see that this is the case. And when this is the case, um, the, the, in order for the base loop to be gapped, in order for the boundary between different top 2D topological order to be gapped, it is often the case uh, that the gauge charge has to be condensed. So uh, even in the simplest Z2 cross Z2 example uh, in this category, um, uh, the B flux loop, um, sorry, if we have a B flux loop and then we have a, a two A flux loop linked with it, that exchange give you an I statistics. That means the B flux loop is the boundary between 2D toric code and 2D double semion. And for which if we wanted to be gapped, 
we have to condense the the Z two gauge charge. So so the gauge charge has to condense uh, on a flux loop, even though this is some abelian gauge theory. So in in this situation, it also shows up very naturally. Uh, yeah, the 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 gauge charge, the first gauge charge has to condense on the second flux loop. Um, of course, in in the situation I started with, the three plus one d toric code, which is a simple uh, vanilla uh, z two gauge theory, um, the the Cheshire string, the flux loop doesn't have to be Cheshire, meaning that uh, the gauge charge doesn't have to condense on the flux loop. It's not a requirement. Um, but all these proposals about higher category description of three plus one topological order saying that, well, we also need to take the Cheshire string into consideration. And in particular, uh, that um, um, this basically, the way I understand higher category structure is that there are a bunch of objects and there are relations among objects and there are relations among relations and maybe relations among relations of relations. Um, so, so this proposal about higher category description of three plus one D topological order is saying that um, even for the vanilla uh, three plus one D Tauri code, we need to start uh, by putting Cheshire string as a, as a fundamental object uh, in the description. So when we try to characterize the excitations in three plus one D Tauri code, instead of saying the fundamental objects are, the, the basic objects are the gauge charge and gauge flux loop, the higher category theory is saying that, well, let's start from uh, defects that are one dimension and then go down the dimension layer by layer. So, so the one dimensional objects are of course the trivial object and then the flux loop and then the Cheshire string. Uh, and then they're composite. So this is like raising the 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 status of the Cheshire string to very high level, as as high as the flux loop, and not even including uh, the gauge charge yet. And the gauge charge, of course, shows up on the second level, uh, where we're considering domain walls uh, between these one dimensional objects. So the the mathematical term is the morphism um, between them. Of course, we can have um, trivial morphism, and we can have gauge charge uh, as a non-trivial morphism, uh, for example, on the, on the trivial defect or uh, the flux loop defect, and there, there are many others. So yeah, so, um, so like I said, I'm trying very hard to understand what is going on. And uh, and try to start from my very naive perspective, and try to make sense of things. And one of the the big confusion I had is, well, when we talk about Cheshire string, we talk about all these modification of Hamiltonians, and we talk about higher category. Um, but this is well from a from a quantum information perspective, at least, this is not how we usually talk about uh, fractional excitations. Uh, Let's say in in a for for two D topological order we have anions, and the most important object that we talk about is actually the string operator uh, that create the anion. So, um, so so when we learn about toric code, we learn how to generate these uh, anions uh, using string operators, and the string operator carries all the information about the statistics and about everything about. Uh, the topological spin about the rating statistics and even about the F move. Uh, we can calculate everything uh, using the string operator. And also the, the flux loop, it's the same thing. Uh, the flux loop, uh, we know that it's non-trivial because it can only be generated as the boundary of a unitary uh, membrane operator. And, uh, and, and the way it's generated also give you the statistics and we can calculate not just the, the charge and flux loop statistics, we can also calculate the loop loop statistics. Everything comes from the invisible <laughs> membrane operator that generate uh, the flux loop excitations. So my question about Cheshire string is, 
uh, oh, sorry, their, their, com their commutation gives the statistics. So my question about uh, Cheshire string uh, is that, uh, can we generate Cheshire string with a unitary operator? Because if we can generate it with a unitary operator, I can potentially thinking about moving it and maybe fuse it with something else and move it around something else and then uh, and do some non-trivial operation with it, right? And then uh, um, because if if I if I define it as um, as the the modification of a Hamiltonian, then if I try to move the defect, do I just change the Hamiltonian back? It's not obvious to me at all. I don't I don't know how to how to think about motion of the defects and their relations uh, in terms of um, changing the Hamiltonian to create a, uh, the defect. Okay, so that that was uh, my question. So well, we say, okay, let's let's do this in the simplest case. Uh, let's not even talk about uh, three plus one D toric code. Let's back off and talk about two plus one D uh, toric code because in two plus one D we can also let the gauge charge condense and we can uh, modify the Hamiltonian and generate a uh, a Cheshire string type of defect. And let's see how we generate that uh, in two plus one D toric code. And actually, once we, once we're done with the exercise. Once we learn how to generate Cheshire string in these systems, we also see uh, why Cheshire string is a new type of defect and how to think of it in relation uh, to all the all the all the defects that we knew before, like gauge charge and gauge flux. Hey, Chief, okay. can I ask a quick question? Yes. You mentioned that um, so you define this Cheshire string. Uh, by basically modifying the Hamiltonian. And you said using that definition, it's not clear what motion corresponds to. Could you not define motion as like taking a unitary operator, which when you conjugate that Hamiltonian produces a new Hamiltonian, which has the interpretation that the Cheshire string is somewhere else or yeah. does that make that's, sense? That's a, you, that would be a unitary way of doing, yeah, exactly. Oh, I see, okay, that's what you're aiming for. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when we find the unitary operator, I believe that um, if you conjugate the ham the original Hamiltonian, you will get the the new Hamiltonian of the move defect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, right. So, so yeah. So this is uh two plus one D toric code. So I'm just drawing a square lattice here, uh, and then uh. And here are the um, uh, Hamiltonian terms, the plaquette term, and the vertex term. Uh, and I want to choose the convention uh, that uh, the plaquette term correspond to charge excitation. This is just because our paper is written this way, and I want to be consistent with the convention. So plaquette operators correspond to charge excitations. Okay. okay. So then uh, if we want to create a pair of charge excitation, I can apply a single sigma z uh, on one of the edges, and then I will have created uh, two charge excitations. And if I want to, and in particular, if I enforce this as the Hamiltonian, if I enforce this very little short segment of string operator as the Hamiltonian, I'll basically be projecting this, uh, this vertical edge into uh, the zero state. So this is the Cheshire string state. So if I have a longer uh, Cheshire string, basically I would have the Z everywhere, right? And then all the vertical edges will be in uh, the zero state. And if we write it in the original basis of charge excitations, uh, this will be a superposition of no charge excitation, two excitation, two far away excitations, four excitations, basically all the even um, possible configurations of, of charge excitations along the defect. Yeah, so now the question is, out of the background of 2 plus 1 toric code, how can I generate such a defect um, um, using unitary operators? Okay, so one thing I want to say first is that, uh, uh, one thing I want to say first is that this is different. This kind of uh, um, Cheshire defect is different from flux loop defect 
in the sense that we know that flux loop have to be generated as the boundary of a two-dimensional membrane operator. It can only be a boundary. And because of that, uh, flux loop cannot end. It, can just, it, it cannot have end point. It has to be closed loop. A potential string is not. Potential string can definitely end. We can have it on any segment. So, so treasure string does not have to be generated as the boundary of a 2D thing. Instead, it, it can actually be generated uh, in, in its own dimension, basically along this one dimensional uh, line. So, so that feels a little weird because, because when we talk about anions, when we talk about anions, it's very, very important that anions cannot be generated locally. Uh, if if anything that can be generated at, within this local region of the anion excitation, that has to be uh, a trivial excitation. That's what we call non-fractional uh, excitation. So so the fact that a uh, Cheshire string can be generated in, in, in its own dimension, uh, but it somehow has to be non-trivial, that is also something we're trying to understand. Uh, yes, Zhu Hong. Uh, so when we add this minus sum over zi terms to the toriko Hamiltonians, do we still keep the original a and b terms along the locus of the defect? Yeah, sorry. The, the, the these terms, the the, the a, a terms, they don't commute with the z, so we throw away all the a's. Oh, we throw away all the a's. I see. <laughs> sorry, I'm confusing you about all this. <laughs> no, no, no. Thanks. <laughs> just want to understand yeah. Hamiltonian. Right. We just throw away all the a's. Yeah, mm -hmm. we probably we probably don't need to do anything to the bees. Um, although the bees kind of get truncated, um, because one of the Z is already satisfied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, but we, we can't keep the A's. The A's don't commute with them. So we, or another way of saying is that we turn these Z term to be very very big. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah thank you. Can I just ask a slightly more motivational question? So basically you're trying to generate with a unitary a condensation defect and sort of more high, high energy language. Exactly. Why is this? So in a continuum model, that's not something that you might want to necessarily do. I know, right? Is there like a, a, some other reason why this is a useful thing for you to consider? Uh, no, because I'm not a continuum person to start with, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but also in the lattice model, so you essentially want to create and, and, and be able to create this unitary these type of excitation. So there must be some utility of that for you. Yeah, so, so we'll see uh, eventually how this language allows us to talk about uh, equivalence class. Of okay. Uh, excitations that that's mm -hmm. as far as we get now uh that we see how what there's a class of treasure string like defects there's a class of flux like defects and we can use this quantum circuit language to generally define uh, equivalence class of defects and then now uh, we can talk about Thanks. fusion uh, uh as a result of that and uh and hopefully hopefully going forward uh, we'll be able to explore um, more structure of the higher category theory, which I'm still trying very hard to understand. But but higher category is definitely, it will contain way more data than just equivalence class and fusion rules. It will have, I don't even know what it has. <laughs> yeah, okay. but Thanks. I can imagine that they, they might they might follow from here. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, I don't really know from a continuum perspective what this exactly corresponds to, but um there might there might be some correspondence. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. And actually, as as I'm going to talk about this, this has a very close connection to all the uh, non invertible um, symmetry that people discuss uh, in high energy. And this is the 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 way we to generate treasure defect is actually very closely directly related to how we perform the kramer vanier duality, which is a non-invertible symmetry uh, in a, in a one-dimensional chain. So, so let me explain this part. So, so yeah, so the way we, uh, well, this this is what Matt or Nat um, proposed, that uh, the way we can try to come up with a circuit uh, that generate the treasure defect 
is by thinking in the in the ungaged uh, picture where we say, okay, let's get rid of the Z2 gauge field and just think of this as a system with Z2 symmetry, global Z2 symmetry. Then what happens along the defect is that, uh, well, everywhere else, it's a symmetric state, trivial symmetric state, uh, if which if you couple the gauge field will become toric code. Uh, but along the defect, uh, there's actually spontaneous symmetry break happening. So along the defect, there's a there's a symmetric to symmetry breaking uh, transition happening uh, from the paramagnetic phase uh, to the ferromagnetic phase, the, the GHC state. And uh, and the, the reason we did it this way is because I show as I showed you the first paper we wrote uh, were about how to map between gap phases. So we had a, a solution to this problem of how to map between uh, a symmetric phase to symmetry breaking phase uh, in a Wendy system. Okay, so it turned, uh, so this this system of course has a has a Z two symmetry, and we want to map between the the product symmetric state to uh, the GHC symmetry breaking state, and we came up with a circuit uh, for it. And uh, so just to briefly explain what this notation means. So each black box, uh, sorry, each blue box, each blue box is a set of two local unitary and, uh, and involves a pi over four rotation by a single X and a pi over four rotation by a pair of ZZ. So, so just two pi over four rotations uh, inside a blue box. And the way we implement the circuit is by apply the, the gate set to qubit one, two, two, three, three, four, and so on and so forth in, in a ladder way. So we move along the chain, but we do the gate set one by one. Okay. And this is how uh, we find that we, we the, the kind of circuit that we need in order to map from uh, a paramagnet phase to uh, a symmetry breaking phase. And this circuit is actually very unusual uh, because if we think about the so-called circuit depths, meaning that how many layers we need in order to complete the transformation, we actually need a number of steps that scales with system size, right? Because we're doing one, two, two, three, three, four, and it goes up. So we need a linear depth circuit in order to implement this. Yes, Shuhan. Uh, yeah, so uh, in the last link, do you have the R of X or not? Yeah, uh, in the last one, we if you want everything to work, you will need to do a projection. Uh, but if we're just happy with the open segment, uh, like what we're thinking about for the for the treasure string, we're just thinking about open segment, uh, we can just keep it keep it like this. So in this figure, I, I should not identify M plus one with one. M plus one with one. Uh, M oh, plus one is the last yeah, sign. Confusing. Yeah, so so something, if we strictly do this, uh, something nasty will show up on the boundary. Uh, th there's something ugly. If you want everything to be nice looking as uh, xi to zi, zi plus one, uh, then some, some kind of projection is needed. So this is the same story as the, um, the non-invertible symmetry of Kramer-Vanya duality. Yeah, but, just, but for later purposes, you will only apply it on the open chain, on uh, open segment. Is that right? Uh, yeah. If we want to uh, apply it to a closed segment, to a closed ring, uh, then some kind of projection is needed to take care of the, the defect sector. Okay. The project but is no longer a circuit, right? With the projection, it's no longer a unitary circuit. Um. Yeah. So just the last step, but before that, it's all fine. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Right. So, so, but, but we want to use this unitary language because this, this, this structure, uh, this step-by-step -step structure, uh, tells us something non-trivial uh, about the defect. Uh, even though that in the last step we might need to fix the boundary condition, but if we don't worry too much about that and just look at the uh, uh, circuit on an open segment we see this so-called sequential structure because we're applying gate set one, two, two, three, three, four, step by step, and we're moving from the left end all the way to the right end of the system. And so this is this is a type of what we call a sequential 
quantum circuit. And, uh, and it becomes a very important tool as we discuss the mapping between uh, gap quantum phases in our first paper. Uh, okay, so here is just some a little bit more detail about why the circuit works, and you can check that. Uh, sorry, you can check that uh, in the bulk of the system. <laughs> in the bulk of the system, the mapping works well, uh, although on the boundary, uh, something messes up, and and this is what we call a sequential uh, linear depth circuit. Okay, so now to uh, Cheshire string. Um, um, knowing how to map from a symmetric phase to a symmetry breaking phase in a 1D chain uh, can, can give us a lot of help in thinking about how to generate a Cheshire string inside uh, a two-dimensional toric code because, because this is basically the gauge version of it. We can just imagine that originally we had a, a 2D symmetric, Z2 symmetric state, but then we want to induce symmetry breaking on one of the, the lines. And then if we if this is all coupled to Z2 gauge field, this is exactly Tori code uh, with a Cheshire string defect. So what we need to do is to take the previous circuit and write it in a gauge version. It's basically doing some operator replacement. So we're replacing the single X. So uh, can I ask you about uh, what is the what is the precise Cheshire string you're looking at? Is Are you condensing a boson or a, a fermion of the toric code? Oh, yeah, it's boson. This is the, the string operator. It's just a Z. Ah, okay. It's Thanks. a boson. Yeah. Right. So, so take the, the circuit we had on the previous page and just replace the sigma X with the AP because X was the symmetry charge operator and measures the symmetry charge and AP measures the gauge charge. So they correspond to each other and uh, also replace the ZZ operator with the single Z. So the ZZ create a pair of charge and here a single Z create a pair of charge. So basically uh, taking that circuit and replacing it with uh, the gauged version of the operator and that's it. And the way the circuit has to be implemented uh, is uh, is again sequential. Now we have to start from the left end of the the defect, and then move step by step, uh, and uh, towards the other end. So we do step one, step two, step three, and so on until uh, the end of the chain. Of course, if we want to connect back, uh, we'll need to do some measurement to fix the boundary condition. Okay. So. This is again uh, what we call a sequential linear depth circuit. So we see that in order to generate a Cheshire string, we need to use a sequential linear depth circuit. And uh, uh, what happens in the circuit is that we're basically, uh, if you keep track of the operator mapping uh, through the circuit is that uh, these, um, AP operators will be mapped to the Z operators. Uh, so the Hamiltonian is just replacing uh, the AP terms with the Z terms. Uh, so indeed, like uh, what Shuhan was asking, this is indeed what is done uh, when we generate it, uh, when we change the Hamiltonian to, to get to the Cheshire string. Uh, but then the total charge on the, the outside, when we measure the total charge, this operator doesn't change. So the total charge still remains invariant. Yes, Chuhu. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure I understand. So let's compare the case when this is an open segment versus the case when it's a closed loop. So in the case when it's an open segment, if I understand correctly, this can be created by a unitary operator. And therefore the Hamiltonian with that deformed uh, modification along the defect is unitarily equivalent to the original Tori called Hamiltonian. However, when you have a closed loop, you have to do a measurement at the very last step. And therefore, the Hamiltonian with the closed Cheshire string defect is not unitarily equivalent to the original Tori called Hamiltonian. Uh -huh. 
So in a way, I would say the the Cheshire string on an open defect, since it's unitarily equivalent to the original Tory code Hamiltonian by unitary transformation, it means that it's a trivial defect, right? Because you can annihilate it. Just like if you have a pair of Z2 gauge charge, you can pair and like that. Yeah, that's the crucial difference. So because this is sequential circuit, not a finite depth circuit. If if we can generate a defect with a finite depth circuit, we consider it to be trivial. But a sequential circuit does not preserve locality. Uh -huh. It's not preserve locality. So local Hamiltonian terms can be mapped to non-local terms. So this is uh this is uh this is definitely it's they're unitarily related, but locality get messed up. Uh, so I wouldn't call it a, a legitimate Hamiltonian in the end. Um, I, I'm asking because in the continuum, if the if this defect doesn't wrap around a non-trivial cycle, then I think we usually view it as a trivial defect. Uh huh. But on the lattice, um, even though it's unitarily equivalent to the original Hamiltonian. Your point is that it's not a finite depth unitary, so you don't view it as, as a trivial defect. Um, no, no, it's like if uh, if I have a flux loop in the bulk, I don't need it to stretch across non-trivial cycles. I just have a locally have a flux loop, have some flux loop, have a charge, and go around. Yeah, so just bulk excitations. Yeah, but in the continuum, it will correspond to a trivial defect because in the continuum, the excitation becomes very heavy. It's just a defect wrapping around a trivial cycle and we can freely shrink it. On the lattice, I agree, it's a non-trivial excitation. So so do you consider flux loop uh, along a, a trivial cycle to be a trivial defect? In the continuum, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Then in that sense, yeah. Okay. I guess, yeah, that's... The but difference. for the Cheshire string, when it wraps around a non-trivial cycle, there's a measurement at the very end. Yeah, so that, that makes a big difference. It does. It does. Yeah, it it, it changes things. Uh, it, it will matter later. I can imagine. Um, okay. but, uh, so far we're good. <laughs> so far we're we're safe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But that that's a very important point. Uh, right. So, so what happens is that, um, and of course, now we can check that if we tunnel a charge uh, like this into the Cheshire string, it will disappear. It will just not make an excitation. Okay. Mm. Okay. So the, the lesson we learned is that the generation of Cheshire string uh, requires a sequential linear depth quantum circuit. And it's linear. Uh, in the length of the string. So uh, so this is uh, the take-home message uh, that we get. And it cannot be um, lower than linear depths. This is also proven uh, on a lattice level. I, I'm not sure if I cited a, the reference that we cannot map from product state to GHZ state with anything lower than linear depths. This is proven by Sergey Bravi and uh, Frank Verstrada. Um, many, many years ago. And uh, and co correspondingly, if we want to generate a Cheshire string inside a TARP code, we cannot do it with anything less than linear depth circuit. Okay. Uh, but then once we have generated one, uh, we can now talk and potentially think about moving one or deforming one or fusing two, right? And talk about these equivalence relations among defect. For example, if we start from a defect like this, a Cheshire string like this, and we want to uh, deform it, make it fatter, make it thicker, uh, we can use the same gate set, and you can see the, the same gate set, uh, but oriented uh, parallel to each other. And because we oriented parallel to each other, these gate sets commute with each other. So we can apply them in a single step, meaning that if we want to if we start from a, a defect and we just want to make it thicker, make it um, just look slightly different, this can be done with a finite depth circuit. Okay, so. 
And then if we want to make it thinner, we can do another layer of uh, commuting gate set. So this is another finite depth circuit that will shrink it back from width two back to width one. And of course, if we combine these two steps, we have a two-step circuit. We have a depth two circuit that can move the Cheshire string by one lattice constant. So if we want to just move the Cheshire string, we can do it with a finite depth circuit. So deformation and movement of Cheshire string requires only a finite depth quantum circuit, finite in the, in the lens of the string. And then we can talk about a fusion. So let's say we have two Cheshire strings. I want to fuse them together. And then uh, we can uh, apply some circuit, some unitary, um, to, to fuse them together. And we can check that the unitary is, again, uh, a finite depth circuit. And you can see that when we fuse them, what happens is that we make the defect thicker. And then we decouple, uh, we decouple the middle line um, from everything else. So the, the middle line is decoupled into a 1D chain of itself. And this is basically uh, Shu Heng and other people talk about uh, this, this coefficient uh, of the fusion result that uh, when you fuse two treasure string, uh, there's a one plus one D uh, Z2 gauge theory basically uh, as the coefficient. Yeah, so so we can so the coefficient of course it's there's a, a, a ZZ coupling term so there's two full degeneracy you can put them all in the zero state or we can put them all in the in the one state so if we're just lazy we'll we'll write C cross C is two C but this two is is not a is is better not right written as a number but better as a as a one plus one D theory but decoupled uh, from the bulk. Okay, so so here the take home message is that a fusion of defects only takes a finite depth quantum circuit. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so this is, yes, sure. Uh, yeah, before you move on to three plus one, I, I'm curious, uh, I know in your paper you discuss it, but can you say a few words about the case when you um, condense a fermion along a line? Did we talk about it on paper? Fermions? No, we cannot condense fermions. But oh, you mean a Narana chain? Yeah. Yeah. If we, if let's say we have a, a just Tori code. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have that. Uh. So yeah. So in Tori code, there's a fermion, and if we uh, higher gauge the fermion, uh, in a one D defect, it becomes a Marana chain. Uh, with a with a Marona mode at the end, and the intermediate part is a invertible defect. That's uh, right. Basically, like EM duality defect. In right. that one, uh, we can also create it with a sequential quantum circuit. So, so I think I have that later. Yeah, I'll come to that in a few slides. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, I guess my question is, the fact that we need a sequential linear uh, circuits to create this defect, does it have to do with the non-invertibility? Or no, or not? No. Yeah, huh? no. Any non-trivial defect. Well, this so-called descendant defect. I see. Um, I see. Created sequentially. Otherwise, it's a trivial defect. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, right. So the story in three plus one D is very similar, although it looks just more complicated. Uh, the, again, we uh call uh, excitation in the cube to be a gauge charge. Uh, and now if we want to create a Cheshire string, let's say from C0 to Cn along a 1D defect, we can use a, a very similar uh, gate set, which is just replacing the uh, the Plaquette term with a cube term, and then everything else is the same. And we do it sequentially, uh, we can generate a Cheshire defect uh, with a linear depth circuit. Uh, and then, uh, and then once the treasure string is generated, we can make it thicker with a finite depth circuit. And we can 
move it with a with a finite depth circuit. We, this is all in parallel to what we did in two plus one D. So movement and deformation of Cheshire string in three plus one D toric code is also realized by finite depth circuit. Yeah. So generation with sequential linear depth circuit, the movement and deformation with finite depth circuit. Okay. And fusion again with a finite depth circuit. So here I'm also lazy, I just wrote a two. Uh, yeah. Okay. So so again, uh, as Shuhu mentioned, there are other defects in two plus one in code. There are actually six types of defects, and there's a big fusion table. And we wrote in our paper <laughs> how to sequentially generate each of them. And then uh, uh and then how to fuse every pair of them using a finite depth quantum circuit. Okay, so so yeah, so this SI, uh, this is the invertible one. And uh, and this one, because it corresponds to generating a, a Marana chain, which we know has to be done with a sequential quantum circuit. So this one is also sequentially generated. It cannot be generated with a finite depth circuit. Okay, so this allows us to put uh, treasure string-like defects into perspective uh, in relation to uh, the original kind of excitations that we talk about for topological phases. So originally, we usually talk about anions and flux loops, right? <laughs> so if it's a abelian anion, abelian anion, uh, then to generate a pair of abelian anion, we need a 1D unitary, we need a string operator. Uh, but if it's a billion anion, uh, that string operator can be um, can can be done in one step. But it's it's it has to be done in a one D fashion. But but in one step we can do that. We can generate a very far away pair of a billion anions. So this is finite depth a uh, one D circuit for generation. Mm -hmm. And then the equivalence between a billion anions is given by local unitary. By local I mean zero dimensional a local unitary, just on top of the anion. So that's the equivalence, and that's what gives rise to the, let's say, fusion rule of the anions. Similarly, for non-abelian anion, the equivalence is also given by zero-dimensional local unitary, but the generation is given by sequential linear depth circuit, one-dimensional sequential linear depth circuit. Um, this is because non-abelian anion, we have to do it step by step, we have to drag them apart step by step. So this is sequential linear depth circuit in 1D. Uh, and then in order to generate a billion flux loop, uh, similarly, we can use finite depth 2D circuit. And for non-abelian flux loop, we use sequential linear depth 2D circuit, while the equivalence relation between the flux loop is given by finite depths when these circuit. So if we have two flux loop, we can use finite depths quantum circuit, when these circuit to fuse them or to move them or to deform them. Okay. So these are of course what people usually call the elementary excitations. Uh, and then once we start talking about descendant excitations, which are made up of these elementary excitations, we see how they are, in a sense, related and also different uh, from the elementary excitations in terms of how to generate them and how, how to think about their equivalence. For example, if we have um, invertible one-dimensional descendant defect, for example, if we have the, uh, that, that include the, the Marana string, the, and the one Shuhan was talking about, the, uh, where fermions, in a sense, condense, uh, or if we have a bosonic charge, we can have SPTs. We can have some SPT uh, defect inside a topological bulk. Um, those kind of defects are invertible because the Marona's chain and SPT phase, they're all invertible phases. <laughs> and these invertible defects, they're also non-trivial defects, and they have to be generated with sequential linear depths, 1D circuit. But also because they're, they're uh, 
invertible, they can also be generated with finite depth 2D circuits. So they can actually be generated as a boundary of 2D, 2D memory. And because it's invertible defect, um, the 2D circuit can be finite depth. And once they're generated, uh, their equivalence class is given by finite depth 1D circuit. And then the Cheshire is actually uh, a, a kind of non-invertible 1D descendant defect. And they are generated with just sequential linear depths, uh, 1D circuit with equivalence given by finite depths, uh, 1D circuit. So we see that uh, this, of course, doesn't happen in zero dimension when we're talking about anions. For anions, it just, the only difference is 0D local or not 0D local, right? And that's, locality has one meaning, basically meaning that whether you are around the region or not. Uh, but for, starting from one dimension and higher dimension, locality has more subtle meanings because even within the dimension, we have the distinction between finite depth circuit and sequential circuit. And, uh, and, 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 and finite depth circuit is in a sense more local uh, uh, than sequential circuit. But of course, compared to 2D circuit, they're, they're, they're lower dimension. So can I also generate a Cheshire string using a sequential linear depth 2D circuit? Yes. Okay. If you want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you want to, if you really want to do a 2D memory operator and generate non-invertible descendant defect, yes. Then, but, but yeah, you're right that you have to use a sequential linear depth 2D circuit to generate it. I see. So, so it seems that I, I think as Shuheng was pointing out earlier, I was asking about earlier that Sequential linear depth corresponds to non-invertibility and finite depth is about invertibility. There is this one-to-one -one correspondence that always holds. Sorry, you were saying finite depth corresponds to invertibility? Invertible, invertible things. Oh, you mean from higher dimension? Yeah. Yeah, if you think about the, the generating membrane operator from 2D, then the difference between finite depth and, sequ and, uh, and uh, sequential gives you the difference between non-invertible and invertible, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's what I was asking. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, so then I, uh, oh, sorry, I'm already past my time. I'll try to be quick. Uh, so this is about uh, um, the, 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 the first level of the higher category structure that we have one dimensional defect. Of course, then we can go on to talk about domain walls on these one-dimensional defects, which mathematicians call morphism between objects. And these become simple again because they're zero-dimensional objects. And, uh, and, and for these one-dimensional defects, sorry, for these domain walls, zero-dimensional domain walls on one-dimensional defect, um, we see that their, their generation will need one-dimensional circuit for them to be non-trivial but then their equivalence is given by zero dimensional local unitary. So this is completely in analogy to the usual anion we're talking about. Okay. Although, although here um, it's, it doesn't have to be anions, it's a more general notion of zero dimensional defect. So for example, anions of course belong to this category. Anions can be thought of as trivial domain, uh, sorry, domain was on a trivial one dimensional defect. And then we can put anions gauge charge on top of a flux loop, that's also um, a non-trivial type of domain wall. Um, we can put, we, we cannot put gauge charge on a Cheshire string because it disappears, right? So gauge charge on a Cheshire string is not a, a non-trivial defect, non-trivial domain wall. Um, but gauge charge on a SPD defect, that is a non-trivial domain wall. And the flux loop linked on a Cheshire string uh, is a non-trivial domain wall. And flux loop link with a flux loop. Uh, that's a non-trivial domain. So all these, we can talk about them uh, using uh, the language of circuit uh, because they have to be generated using one dimensional circuit. They cannot be generated by themselves, uh, but then the equivalence class of these domain walls. If we want to say, okay, given a 1D defect, what are the equivalence class of domain walls? Uh, for that, we can use uh, the, the zero D local unitary to study that. Okay, to summarize um, that uh, we, uh, 
uh, we use this idea of sequential quantum circuit trying to characterize, first of all, gap quantum phases. And then, of course, in, for this talk, I'm mostly talking about uh, gapped defects. Right. So this this idea, of course, is this word is not new. People use it a lot already. And uh, and the, the pattern of sequential circuit can be, uh, there can be a variety of them. In 1D, it's usually just moving from left to right. In 2D, you can imagine that we can go patch by patch and, and layer by layer. And even radially, we can have different, different, uh, different patterns. Uh, but, uh, but the way we define a sequential circuit is that um, there's some sequential application of local unitary such that such that each local degree of freedom is acted upon by a finite number of gates. And the consequence of that is that it, the total number of gates to go with the volume of the, of the system, but also that the circuit preserves entanglement area law. So that's the most important part. That's why we, we can talk about finite depth quantum circuit, then we can talk about sequential quantum circuit, and we don't need to worry about anything in between. So it's like a, a discrete level structure when we want to talk about gap things. For gap things, finite depth quantum circuit, of course, preserves everything. It preserves locality, correlation, entanglement, and preserves area law. And sequential quantum circuit doesn't preserve a lot of these things, doesn't preserve locality, doesn't preserve correlation or short range entanglement, but it does preserve entanglement area law. So that's why it's the next level of talking about anything uh, that's gapped, whether it's just gap phases or gap defects. Yeah, because of that, it preserves gap. Okay. So yeah, so what I'm what I tried to talk about is that uh, these descendant topological descendant excitations, uh, we can generate them in their own dimension with a sequential quantum circuit and the equivalence class of d-dimensional defects are given by d-dimensional finite depth quantum circuit. And the deformation, movement, and fusion are all given by these finite depth circuit. Okay, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shia, for a very uh, clear talk. Uh, so if there are any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly. Yeah, uh, so you talked about uh, taking a gate charge near the Cheshire string and then it disappears in the Cheshire string. Uh, but there can also be charges that live inside Cheshire string that cannot be pulled out into the bulk. So in, in a two-category language, these correspond to endomorphisms uh, of uh, this object. Uh, corresponding to the Cheshire string. Uh, sorry, you're saying that there are uh, charges living inside the Cheshire string that cannot be pulled out. Yeah. Uh huh. So they're, they're in, inside the condensate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I was wondering if you know uh, how to produce them using these sort of circuits. I I sorry I don't I don't know how to. I mean, they're already a condensate, so you already have a lot of. I don't exactly know uh, how to like generate one more charge inside a condensate, other than just to putting by hand. So this is like the Wilson line. So because uh, condensate is gauging uh, the bulk symmetry, yeah. uh, this is the Wilson line for that symmetry that uh, yes. inside. Yes, yes, yes. The Wilson line will will bring a charge. From the bulk into the condensate, right? Is that? I know, no, this is not something that lives in the bulk. So the bulk charges disappear in the Cheshire, Cheshire string, but there are extra charges in the Cheshire, Cheshire string that cannot be pulled out. Oh, extra charge inside the Cheshire string that cannot be pulled out. Oh, you mean domain walls inside the Cheshire string? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that would be, I, I suppose that would be, a, well, the only kind of non trivial. Domain wall on Cheshire string, I know is the, the flux loop link with a Cheshire string. I see. Like a, a symmetry breaking domain wall, all up and all down. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yes, yes, yes. That's how I understand it. That is a flux loop link with a, with a Cheshire string. Yeah, so, so this generated, sorry. 
Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I want to know how they're generated. Oh, they, they, they can be generated uh, along the Cheshire string with a, uh, you, you need to generate a pair. You cannot mm -hmm. just generate one, you need to generate a pair yeah, and uh, and with a 1D finite depth circuit. So yeah, in the so same, same case. Is this now after applying the sequential linear depth circuit, you apply another finite depth circuit on top of it? Or it does it somehow interact yeah. with the... Yeah, so I'm assuming that you already have the Cheshire string and then you want to generate the, the domain one. Then mm -hmm. the domain one needs to be generated with a 1D circuit. If you want to do that in one step, yeah, yeah, I just, I don't think it makes a difference. I see. Okay, thanks. Thank you. But, but this this flux loop uh, can uh, leak into the bulk, right? In, in this picture. Uh, uh, leaking to a bulk. It cannot so, be unlinked. It, it cannot, cannot be unlinked, but it can expand and uh, like yeah. access other areas of the bulk, of course. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I suppose so. So yeah, I, but we have to make it back. So, uh, Lakshya, you're asking for something that's only living on the Cheshire string or, or something that can uh, move around in the 3D. Uh, yeah, oh, here's the it? one that, that, complete, that only lives inside the string. So, the dual quantum symmetry for the gauging. The dual quantum symmetry for the gauging. Yeah, I, 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 I would very much like to learn all these from you guys. I mean, um, this is this is maybe not something I immediately know. Um, yeah, maybe we should talk afterwards, so I can really understand what it, what that is. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm trying. What I'm doing here is kind of set up a my my own rule for how I want to play the game. But you guys already have a story, so I want to see if in what sense they, they connect and match. Yeah. Maybe if you, when you, uh, b before you gauge, there was a, a 1D locus where there was like a ferromagnet Hamiltonian, right? Yeah. Uh, what if we change the sign of one of those terms in the yeah, ferromagnet? That's, that is this. Yeah, that's the domain one. I see, that becomes this. Yeah, okay. exactly. That's I this, see. yeah. Okay. But, but the, yeah. After gauging, it becomes this loop uh, uh, wrapping the Cheshire string. I see. Okay. Are there also these circuits for uh, surface defects in 3D? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it will be 2D sequential circuit if you want to generate, let's say, invertible defects, invertible 2D defects inside 3D bulk. Or also uh, some topologically ordered slices. Uh, yeah. yeah, so so in our first paper, uh, we did a pretty exhaustive study of all kinds of gap phases. We 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 basically did case by case, like one D, two D, three D, uh, topological uh, digraph written string net uh, fractal. <laughs> so so taking those circuits and maybe gauging it. Uh, yeah, we can get defects in all kinds of dimensions. So a, a math question, If uh, do you know if there's some relationship between these circuits and uh, algebra objects inside these higher categories? If have, you haven't, okay. Yeah, I, I very much like to understand this. I talk a little bit to Liang Kong. I talked to Lan Tian as well a little bit. I'm trying to understand all this. I mean, okay. I'm trying to make the connection, but I can't say I understand much. Yes. There's something something very interesting should be going on, I think. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, maybe, perhaps not. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh... Very nice talk. Thank you. So maybe we can stop recording.